you can take it anywhere and you can apply it in any generation on any on any continent it doesn't matter truth is just mobile it works everywhere right and so here are here are ways that we're going to formulate a theological principle in other words when we read a text in the in the bible is there a principle there how do you find that principle well number one the principle should be reflected in the text you should be able to smell it taste it sense it see it read it understand it let me give you a perfect example of what not to do back many many years ago when i was a young preacher i wanted to preach a message on alcoholism and so I went to the book of Genesis, and I was reading a story about Joseph and his brothers uh, selling him to Egypt, and they took his coat of many colors off. Remember that? Dipped it in the blood of one of the dead animals, took it home to Jacob. And Jacob was like, oh, no. And they were like, well, we don't know if it's his or not. And Jacob said, yes, oh, my word, yes, an evil beast hath devoured him. Well, I took that phrase, an evil beast hath devoured him. And I went and did some research on alcoholism. And it was true. All my statistics, all of that stuff was accurate. And I preached a message on the evil beast that will devour you. And it was on alcoholism. I've still got that message in a file. Just for, com just for, comic, just for comic relief. That had absolutely nothing to do with alcoholism. But have you ever heard preaching like that? I've heard guys say, I want to borrow a word. No, you don't. You want to steal it. You're not going to put it back. I want to just borrow this phrase. No, you don't. No, you don't want to borrow a phrase. You want to steal it, take it out of context, weave a belief on it, and, you know, so... <laughs> you're right all right number two the principle should be timeless and not tied to a specific situation not wearing clothes of mingled material is that tied to a specific time and a specific situation yeah so that that's not that's not a principle Worshiping God in spirit and truth, is, is, is that timeless? That's timeless. So that, that is a principle, all right? Then number three, the principle should not be culturally bound. Well, this is only true in Saudi Arabia. Then it's not a Bible principle. This is only true in middle-class white American churches. Then it's not a principle. It's a preference or a prejudice one. Number four, the principle should correspond to the teaching of the rest of Scripture. The Bible is not going to tell you in one instance you can be saved by being baptized and then another verse say that we're only saved by grace through faith. The Bible is not going to contradict itself. In universities all across basically the world, Homer's Iliad is taught as, we have the words of Homer. In the Iliad, we have it. We know that because we have 643 copies of Homer's Iliad extant in, in existence. We can put our hands on 643 copies of his book. Therefore, we know these are the words of Homer, and they're all proud about that. We have 25,000 copies of the New Testament. Why can't we apply that same principle if we have that many copies and parts of copies of the New Testament, why can't we say we have the very words of Jesus? We have the very words of the apostles. You know, they're all proud of 643 copies. Well, we've got thousands upon thousands, so I, I feel pretty positive, you know, that what we have is exactly what Jesus said. And, uh, but it, it, it does not contradict any other portion of the Bible. Number five, the principle should be relevant to both the biblical and the contemporary audience. In other words, it was just as true 
for Abraham as it is for us. Same exact truth. Now, not everything they did is true for us today. Did you know in Israel, <laughs> you cannot get a cheeseburger? They will not serve meat with cheese because the law said that you were not to sod the mother with the, 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 the baby with the mother's milk. You weren't supposed to do that. And so they, they think as a cheeseburger, it, as a violation, that's not a principle. All right. Now, is, is that a description of what? You'd have to do that yourself. I, I don't know if they would even let you do that. I don't, I don't know. They, you can't even do that? You can't even do that. Okay. All right. So these are, these are five. You're going you're gonna to need to know these. These are five things that we need to know about formulating a theological principle. Before we can say the Bible teaches this, it's got to pass these five tests. So I've got to go way beyond, well, my daddy said, or this is what my church says. Hopefully your daddy told you the truth, and hopefully your church preaches the truth, but there's no guarantee. And so what am I responsible for then as a Christian? Can I lean on my pastor's understanding and his knowledge of the Bible and just kind of get on his coattails and, you know? No. Yes, sir? Really? Okay. Very good. All right. Everybody, oh, I don't know how to go back. So if it's if it's gone, I'm sorry. I need to ask y'all. I guess. Did everybody have that? By the way. Oh, I'm in trouble. Okay. Well, she took a picture of the slide. She'll sell it to you for five ninety five. <laughs> for a mere, <laughs> for three payments of six ninety five. <laughs> Oh, goodness. All right. Now, let, let me give you an illustration. Let's go to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. Here's the Moses is dead. We got a brand new guy in a driver's seat. The Lord's talking to Joshua in these first nine verses, and I'm gonna, what I'm going to ask you is a series of questions. Number one, and I'm going to read these out loud in just a minute. What did this text mean to the people that actually heard it? How did they understand it? Number two, what are the differences between the biblical audience and us sitting in this room tonight? Question number three, what is the theological principle in the text? And then number four, how should we apply the theological principle to our lives today? All right, so let's read these. And, and as I'm reading these verses, see if you can formulate some answers to these questions, okay? Now, after the death of Moses, so when was this written? Okay, after the death of Moses. The servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun. That doesn't mean that he didn't have parents. That was their name. That was his daddy's name. Moses' minister saying, Moses, my servant, is dead, just in case you haven't noticed, Joshua. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, Unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, that is the Mediterranean, toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. Mediterranean was east, um, the western part, that, all of that was there. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses. 
so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do all according to the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Now he's going to give him a little pattern of how to do this. Number one. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. It will be your, number one, conversation. Use the principles of this book to talk about. Now, if you want to talk about football, you want to talk about soccer, that's fine. But this is to be the locus. This is to be what everything is built around. So conversation. But thou shalt meditate. Now we're into meditation. So you think about what you talk about, right? So we've got the conversation, and now we're meditating. And meditating is um, kind of like did you, everybody in here's had a tootsie roll pop? The the tootsie rolls, you know, you put it. Did you ever spin the stick to hurry up and get the hard candy off of it? You know, I'd spin that stick, and then I'd get impatient because what were we what were we all after? <laughs> the middle, yes, the middle, and so. Um, and when you finally got to it, it would, really, oh, my goodness, that touch roll was so good. The Bible, meditation is when you take a, a verse, you take what you read, and you're, you're going over in your mind. And after a while, I'm just telling you, the Lord will release its flavor. And you'll go, oh, now I know what that means. And so that's meditation. Kind of like a cow will, you know, regurgitate his cud and go, over. he'll get a little bit more juice out of it, and he'll swallow it again. And he'll come back up and get a little bit more out of it. And so we've got conversation and now meditation. He said, you meditate during day and night. Now, why do you talk about it and why do you meditate on it that thou mayest observe? Now we've got observation. Now what does it mean to observe something? If you observe the speed limit, what are you doing? You're doing the speed limit. All right, so we're not just to talk about it. We're not just to think about it. We're to do it. All right. So we are to uh, do all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. The only place in the Bible where the word success is written is in Joshua 1.8. Have not I commanded thee? Be thou strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. All right, now, question number one. What did that mean to the people or the person who heard it? What do you get? Change of guard. Okay, this was this was God's choice. He he has replaced Moses with an equally godly man. Okay. Um, what are the difference between them and us today? There's some pretty obvious differences, and and maybe. Some Okay. Okay. Right. Didn't have that. How about um, they're Jews? We're not. That's that's pretty big difference. All right. I heard a uh, about an old doctor one time that was talking to some young doctors, and he said, uh, he said, gentlemen, when you hear hoofbeats, don't always think of zebras. Don't when you when you hear hoofbeats, don't always think of zebras. In other words, we we often look for the exotic answer, and sometimes the answer is pretty simple. They were fixing to go into their homeland. We're not. We're home. You know, this is this is where we live. Um, they had just lost a forty-year-old or a forty-year leader. Um, we haven't. And so there are some there are some differences that uh, that are pretty important. Yeah, it can be. You can't. You're exactly right, and that's why that when people get they get hung up on all these details, you know what they wore and what they ate and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and I love that stuff. I think to me that stuff is interesting, 
but I, I need to find the principle, you know. And so I can walk past your closet. Well, there's some really old clothes in there, and they're not they're not cotton and and rayon mix. They're you know, well that's great. And I walk past your cows. You know, they're not mixed breed. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. You know, but I'm I'm headed for the principle because that's what I need to bring back to my town. Um, what is the theological principle in this text? If you will listen to me, I'll give you good success. Is that a principle that is still applicable today? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely it is. Now, I don't know what Joshua had on. I don't care what he had on. I don't know what he had for breakfast that morning. I don't care what he had for breakfast that morning. God told him something that is eternally true, that is still applicable to us today. Um, Now, we're going to step into <laughs> chapter 3. <laughs> now, now, let's get into something that, that seems silly. How to read doesn't... It's really not. It's really not at all. So, and in chapter 3, we're going to look at some principles of how to read the book. <laughs> now, here's... Here's why we need to learn how to read, because that might not say what you think it says. King James was translated in the early 1600s. It was translated into Victorian English. I don't speak Victorian English. They used words in the 1600s that mean the exact opposite of what they mean today exactly the opposite for instance the word let how do if if i say i'm going to let you do something what does that mean you're going to allow in the new testament it meant to prevent yeah yeah not let it means no you're not going to do that see if i let you that meant i stopped you now today if i let you that means i allow you to do it and so can you see where there's there's some pretty important well, what that means is, really? Uh, if you move from an initial reading of the text right to your application of that text, you are going to remain tied to your previous understanding of that text. Now, all that means is this. Let's say you just, you just skim over it real fast, and you assume you know what it means. That's what you're going to believe it means. Okay, so first impressions, very important. And so when we read, we let, let's read like it's the first time we've ever read it. And when, when we're through, maybe even tonight, my prayer is that you will never read the Bible the same again. That it will change the way you even observe the words and the language uh, reading is is more than just word pronunciation. I dare say that everybody in here could read probably any book in the English language. We have advanced vocabularies. Um, we know we know how to speak properly, and so you could read probably any book in the library down here in in Wachula. So, but it's more than just pronouncing words, all right? Words, yes, ma'am. Yeah. 
do it again. <laughs> yeah. And there is an assumption that since you've read it before, the same way, you know, you've, you've done this hurry up reading, that you know what it means. And it just might be that I've missed some words in there that would change the meaning completely. Um, and so we can't simply define words by themselves. In other words, you can't go into a verse and say, well, that word means this. It might mean this in this context, but in another context, it may mean something completely different. Let me give you an example. You remember when um, Jesus was talking to Peter, and he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? What did Peter say? He said, he said, yeah, I love you. And then Jesus said the second time, do you love me? Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm quoting King James English here. Yes, I love you. And then the third time he said, Peter, do you love me? And the Bible says that Peter was grieved that he said it to him the third time. Yes, I love you. Now, on the surface, that just sounds like Jesus was asking him, do you love me? And Peter was saying, well, yeah, I love you. That's not what Jesus was saying. Now, the first time when he used the word love, do you love me, he used the word agape which is God's kind of love, the sacrificial kind of love. And Peter says, here's, here's Peter's first answer. Lord, you know I like you. He used the word phileo, which is a brotherly affection, the city of brotherly love. <laughs> you ever been to a Philadelphia Eagles football game? And uh, so Jesus says, do you love me with a godly love? And Jesus said, yeah, I like you with a brotherly affection. And Jesus asked him again, Peter, do you love me with a godly love? And he said, yes, I like you. And then the third time, Jesus said, Peter, do you even like me? And that's what grieved him. So when you, you get into these words that are linked together and you open these words and you look down, sometimes it's a pretty ugly picture, you know, because we, well, we don't use words exactly the same way. And... Uh, Yeah. Now, I want to give you a, an example. I think it's in, uh, come on, come on, come on. There it is. Look at Proverbs 22, 6. We go through the temperament series every year here. And it's just one of the, the most fun things we do, I think. And <clears throat> the, the home ranch is Proverbs 22, 6. Now, don't, don't, those of you who have been through this, don't say anything. All right, uh, let's see. Marissa, would you read the Proverbs 22, 6? You have it. Uh, read Proverbs 22, 6. Okay, what does that sound like? Does it sound like if you make your kids go to Sunday school, all their lives and then when they leave home they're going to leave church and they're going to get old and they're going to get in the world and then they're going to have 18 minutes left to live and they're going to stumble back into church and they're going to live for the Lord the final 18 minutes of their life is that what you heard you never heard that they'll, they'll come back one day one you know they'll be old um, well what does the word old mean is that chronologically aged? Is he, he's 90 years, that's old, 90 years old. Uh, you know, we, we say, wow, that's, that's really old. Uh, maybe is it out of date? Like, ooh, that meat is out of date, that cheese is out of date. Is that what it means? Just exactly what does the word old mean? Because the Bible says train, and by the way, the word train means to aim. If you hunt, you know that you've got to aim your rifle or your whatever you're shooting. You know, you've got to aim it at the target, the animal, whatever it is. And so train, point the child, and the, I love the word child. It means to scream. <laughs> point, yeah, doesn't it, though? Doesn't it, though? So point the screamer in what direction? According to his way. And the word way means bent. 
everybody has a different bend. Well, I would really love for us to do the temperaments up there on, on Monday night. This would be a great study. Everybody has a different personality type. And the scripture says, if you will point your child according to his personality type, discipline him according to his temperament, love him according to his temperament, do everything according to his particular bent, then when he is old, and here's what the word old means. <laughs> it means to shave the face. Yeah, really. So, when do young men begin to shave their face? What do we call that stage of life? Exactly. So the word old means young. So the when they started their period, that signal they're ready to get married. Exactly right. And so uh, here, just a perfect example of well. And I have, I have heard it preached when they get old, you know. That's not what the Bible says. And so if I will train my child according to his temperament, tra to aim, mm -hmm. hit the target, you're exactly right. Now we all have, yeah, <laughs> we all have different temperaments. Uh, now just real quickly, um, each, each of the types has a motto in life. And I'm going to just go through each motto and, and raise your hand and, and be proud of it. You know, you don't, don't be embarrassed. All right. the, the sanguine, for instance. The sanguine's motto is, if we're going to do it, let's have fun. That's me. You like that? All right. Just, you just have fun. You laugh. You don't get much work done. But bless the Lord, we're going to have a good time. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. But, but that's true. We, we <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they do a sanguine enters a room, mouth first, we're loud, we're, anyway. All right, the second guy is a choleric. And the choleric's motto is, do it my way now and everybody will survive. Anybody do it my way now. All right. That's Paul. This is, this is Lorraine. That just, just do what I tell you to do and we'll be fine. Exactly right. Yeah. Number three is the melancholy. And the melancholy's motto in life is, don't do it if you're not going to do it right. Oh, boy. There we go. All right. Do it. <laughs> do it right or don't do it at all. And uh, now you guys, I, and I've got to be honest, I've got to tell you, it is from the melancholy temperament type that the geniuses come. <laughs> I just had a feeling that was me. I knew that was me. <laughs> yeah, now. Oh, oh, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's me. That's me. Sure it is, Dave. But... Um, it is from that temperament uh, platform that come the writers and the thinkers and the, the musicians and just. Uh, but I bet you, uh, here's here's a sanguine. They're happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad. Then there's lunch. Okay. Or they're happy, they're sad, and then there's Easter. They get depressed for long. And if you ever get on the wrong side of a melancholy because you've done them wrong, God bless you. Because it, it'll take a direct act of the grace of God to be forgiven and put back into good graces. And, and then there's the... <laughs> and then there's the fourth guy, the, the phlegmatic. And the, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, we got one hand. Up. He is, he's our token phlegmatic back there. And their motto in life is, why well, do it at all? Let's, let's take a nap and we can do it tomorrow. You know, oh, is that you too? Okay. But okay. <laughs> now here's what we'll discover. <laughs> yeah. you, have a, you have a primary 
type and you have a secondary type. In other words, you're, uh, excuse me, I'm sanguine phlegmatic. You're, you have a, and you can even tell the, for instance, the melancholies, even the way they dress, the way they do their hair, they're subdued. They wear a lot of dark colors, muted colors, browns, blacks, blues. They're not, they're not flamboyant. They're not loud. You can give them a job of balancing the checkbook, put them in the back of the room, give them a candle, and they'll be happy all day long. You drive a sanguine. Yeah. You drive a sanguine nuts like that, you know, because he'll do it for five minutes and get tired of it, and then he'll run over here and do this for five minutes. And so you need to know. I think there are two things you need to know about yourself. You need to know your temperament type and your spiritual gift. You need to know those things. And so here's a perfect example of, well, I know what the Bible says, do you? Is that what it says? And you find out, no, that's, that's not what it says. Um, so how would you read a love letter? Let's say that you're, you're just hopelessly in love with somebody. Let's say you're engaged. And he works for Florida Power and Light. And there's a big storm in Mississippi. The crew is sent to Mississippi for two months. Power's out, no internet, can't call. But he writes you a letter, and you, and you go to the mailbox one day, and there's this letter from the love of your life. How would you read that letter? Would you go, oh, see, dear, okay, that's nice. Would you read it quickly? Would you scan it? Get the general idea? Would you pour over each word? I remember when he said that to me last week. I know what he meant when he said that word. He used that word. He used that phrase. He, he said I was like this. He said I reminded him of this. He said my, my face looked like this and my, you know. You're making all these connections. You're reading all of these words. And uh, would you throw it away? You'd read it again and again. How many of you ladies have a file of letters? Uh, my mom kept a file of letters that Dad wrote to her when he was in the Army. I don't know where they are now, but th she showed me one time. Uh, she kept, oh, my word, she kept them in order. She was a melancholy. And, you know, October, November, December. And, and uh, so you'd read it repeatedly. Because who wrote that letter? Somebody that you love. And that letter was written to express how that person felt about you. And, oh, my word. So words mean things. Right? Now, we might use words that we don't necessarily mean for instance honey does this dress make me look fat yeah and my my response is honey does this shirt make me look stupid <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, now now, pe yeah, people can use words to not express how they really feel, you know. Babe, how would you like that new dish I made? That was some dish. That was some dish. Yeah, if you quit beating your wife. But my question w would be this. Does God do this? No, he does not. So every word that he has written to us is a powerhouse, all right? So... Uh, there are no self-employed words. There are no vagrant words that just hang around the street corner and get in the, the train of a sentence and not do anything. They're all employed. They all have a job. They all, they all have something to do, something to, something to say to us. And so each word in each sentence has a specific job to do. So when you read the Bible... 
listen for, and I'm going to give you some things in just a second of what to look for when we're reading. So pronouns are incredibly important. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about Peter. We're talking, you know, and, and it makes a difference who that pronoun refers to. And so a cursory reading, this quick scanning, because we live, don't we live in such a hurried culture? Fast food and instant and get it now and microwaves. I, I bought a, a new microwave fireplace for the house, and I can get warm. all. I can stay warm all night in 30 seconds. It's just great. And uh, so we, we all... I'm just kidding, Betty. I didn't do that. Oh, wow. That's one of those Frank looks right there. Man. <laughs> uh, so in reading, you know, we, we can't lay a word off and say, all right, you're fired. Get out of here. We can't do that. All these, they're, they're all fully employed, and they're all making good money. And so I need to get everything I can out of every one of those words. And when you write, we've got a, we've got a writer right here. You, you want to concentrate as much flavor in a sentence or a word. Don't use I, flavorless words. You know, use words that are, that are colorful words. And, and boy, the, the <laughs> it, it, well, it could. But you, when you read the Psalms, there's nothing blah about the Psalms. It's just mountain peak after mountain peak after beautiful sunrise, after explosive sunset, after it's just, it's a wonderful journey of visual beauty. And uh, it, it just, it, it grabs you and will not let you go. So, all right, the message of the Bible is embedded in the language. Now, I'm not saying that we've got to be language scholars, Okay. But the message of the Bible is embedded. It is intertwined in the language of its sentences and its paragraphs. And so we got to read those carefully. So let's say that each of these rocks, right there's a, a word in a sentence. Kick them over. See what they mean. Get your concordance. I will teach you how to use a concordance. It's really pretty simple. Start building a library. I would suggest you build libraries of, with study books. I don't have one Christian novel in my library. Nothing wrong with them. It's just nothing I have an interest in. Um, I, I, I want research books. I want word study books. I want history books. I want, you know, that's, that's what my library is built on. So if you want um, Strong's Concordance, good concordance. Uh, get your get your Bible dictionary. A good Zonderman's got a good Bible dictionary. Uh, yep, this lady right here is our state Bible and tract distributor. She can save what fifty, sixty percent, uh, or forty, or whatever. Okay. Ministerially speaking. Oh, wow! Yeah, they are. They're huge books. So they're just, they're good, 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 good study books. Now, ministerially speaking, 60%. That was just ministerially speaking. So. Yeah. You're blaming a lot on that. You're blaming a lot on that. All right. <laughs> All right. Now, the details in, in our sentences and in our biblical text, uh, the first question that we need to ask is not, what does that text mean? Do you do that when you read the Bible? What does that mean? Don't ask yourself. Don't let that be the primary question. The primary question is what does it say? If we know what it says, we can come know what it means. All right? Somebody, you're talking to your child, and you give them an instruction, and let's say they don't understand your words, do they understand what you mean? So they've got to know what, what, what did you say again? Now, okay, now I know what you said, now I know what you meant. But it's, you can't just, now when we turn that thing around, I've done that a lot with Stacy. Well, what I thought you meant was get milk. No, I didn't say milk. So I didn't know what she said, therefore I know what she meant. 
And so if I understand what she says, sometimes I still might bring home milk. So anyway, so we begin by carefully observing details, details of the text. And so here are some things that we're going to look for in sentences. We are going to become sleuths, verbal detectives. Y'all tired of writing? Hmm? You what? <laughs> well, because I got I got one more on this slide, but I can't I can't do it until y'all through writing. David's got Nancy. He can go home and copy her notes. <laughs> uh, I did hear about a lady one time that bought a new pair of jeans, and she walked up to her husband and said, Honey, do these jeans make me look as big as the side of the house? He said, no, baby, our house ain't blue. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, so we're going to be detectives, and, and here's, here's what we're going to look for, all right? So we're kicking it off right here. Number one, look for repetition of words. Repetition of words. Look in the book of 1 John. First John chapter 2, verse 15, 16, and 17. I'm going to read it. Listen carefully because you, I'm going to ask you to answer some questions when I get through reading this. We don't know what it means, but we're going to find out what it says, okay? All right, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. All right, question number one. <clears throat> is the word world repeated? How many times? Well, let's go through. Verse 15, I see it one, two, three times. You see it three times? All right. Uh, what about verse 16? One, two, three. How about verse 17? So when you come across a repetition of words, that's a clue to what the verse means. All right? We've already figured that out. Are there any other words that are repeated? Love. Exactly. So verse 15. Uh, love not the world, neither things are in the world. Uh, love of the world, the love of the Father. There are three times in verse 15. Uh, verse 16, not in there. Verse uh, 17, no. All right, so three times. So we've got love and world. So what do you think perhaps this verse is about? Not loving the world. Exactly. Not loving the world. That's the... That's the theological principle that we're going to get out of this. Now, he's even going to do us a real favor and give us a list of things that are identified as the world. And we'll get to that in, in just a second. Uh, but those, those are the two words, and it occurs several times in those verses. So this indicates the theme of the text. Don't love the world. 
don't do that. Don't make it your focus. Don't make it what you live for. Don't make it what, what, what you just absolutely get up in the morning and makes your heart beat. Don't do that. Everybody else? Okay. <laughs> We've got a legal mind over here. I'm, I'm not going to be able to slip anything by her. <laughs> All right, now let's look at contrasts. Contrast. Look for items or people that are contrasted with each other. There's a reason they're contrasted. Look at Proverbs 14:31. Proverbs 4 Proverbs 14:31. He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth his maker, but he that honoreth him, him refers to who? Hath mercy, hath mercy on the poor. All right, so we've, we've got two people contrasted with each other. What's... Person number one, what's the first person that's mentioned here? The oppressor, okay? What's the second guy? The, the merciful guy, right. So we've got, we've got two guys. All right, now what does the oppressor do? What's one thing we know he does? Okay. What does the second guy do? He honors God. So there's a contrast right there. Uh, the, the two different types of people in this text are looked at. Now look at Proverbs 15, verse 1. Same opening, basically. A soft, and that word means tender. A soft answer turneth, and the word turneth means to redirect. So let's read it with those words. A soft answer redirects wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. So what, what two things are being contrasted here? Right. Okay, so you've got, you, you've got a choice how you talk to people. You can give them a tender answer, and what does the Bible say will happen to their wrath? It's redirected away from you. Exactly. So you just match their volume, and the wrath is going to contend. You are the target of their wrath. Keep, just keep arguing with them. Just keep it, and it, it's, but uh, give them a tender answer. You are so aggravating to me. I am not. Yes, you, but if I say, what? Yeah, I'm sorry. I know sometimes I can probably be annoying. Hey, what? Well, you're not supposed to agree with that. And what's he going to do? You agree with it. You know, if somebody came to me and said, Preacher, um, you goof around too much in the pulpit. I can't just automatically blow that off. I've got to consider I'm, I may actually do that. I try not to, but, you know, and so uh, it, it will redirect wrath. Now, if you use hard, harsh, abrasive language, it's not going to be turned away. So I see a principle here. I need to learn how to talk to people. I need to learn how to answer people. Even folks that are, are dumb and say dumb stuff and do dumb stuff, you know, I, I, need to, I really need to keep that in mind. All right, look at Romans 6.23. Romans 6, 
for the wages. And the word wages means ration. The ration of sin is death. On the other hand, contrasting that, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. One is as long as the other. Death is as long as life. Eternal death, eternal life, same length. What's being contrasted here? Sin and righteousness. A pretty sharp contrast. For the wages, the ration of sin, you work all your life for sin, and how does it pay you? Death. Wow. Not very grateful. <laughs> the wages of sin is death. But on the other side, contrasting that. So who you want to work for? You know, in whose employee would you rather be? You know, God, very, very definitely. Uh, look at Ephesians 5. Verse number 8. For ye were sometimes darkness. But now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of light. What two things are being contrasted here? Darkness and light. So when you're, you know, when you read scripture, sometimes you're going to come across uh, some contrasts. And, and always take the one that keeps you closer to the Lord. Always, always go that route. You know, always go with the with the soft answer. Now, sometimes the the bad option is first, and so you can't just say, "Well, the first one is always going to be the one I choose." Don't do that. Don't do that. All right. Um, what to look for? Comparisons. <laughs> Comparisons. Now, contrast focuses on differences. Let me give you an example. Uh, we've got Jennifer on this end of the table, and we've got Lorraine on this end of the table. Let's contrast them. What differences are obvious? <laughs> okay. <That. laughs> Does this shirt make me look stupid? I, I got you. I got you. All right, so age. Age is a, is a factor here. What else? Hair. All right, you got short hair, got long hair. Uh, both of you have glasses, so that, uh, that's not a contrast. Um, color of the, the clothes. Single. Married. So we've got some contrast here. Now let's compare it. What do they have in common? Okay, you're women. Okay, you got black glasses. Okay, both here tonight. Yeah, you're American citizens, right? Okay. Uh, you, you're both doing your notes here. Um, now, comparisons focus on similarities. And sometimes in the Bible, there's this contrast. Proverbs is full of this. The godly man does this, but. The ungodly man does this, but. And sometimes there are comparisons. Jesus did this a lot. The kingdom of heaven is like. And so he, he Matthew chapter 13 is the parable chapter. And so um, you've got to know what side of the coin you're on here, you know, in, in this particular case. And so look for items or people who are compared with each other. Proverbs 25, 26. Proverbs 25, 26 says, A righteous man falling down before the wicked. So now what are we talking about here? A righteous man, is he saved? This is a saved man. And he falls down before the wicked. What does that mean? Did he trip? Well, in a manner of speaking, he committed some sort of a, there, there's a moral problem here. Right. 
committed sin. He did something, all right? So a righteous man falling down before the wicked is as, and he's comparing him to something here, a troubled fountain or a dirty spring, dirty water, and a corrupt spring. So what's being compared here? A godly man who commits sin that people used to trust, they used to drink from his counsel, right? Now he's committed some sort of a sin. Nobody wants to drink his water anymore. Nobody wants his counsel anymore because he's dirty. And you know this as well as I do. Once this happens, there will be people that will never let you have a clean spring again. You know, they just, they just won't. So what's the thing to do? Don't, don't do it. Exactly right. And so sometimes comparisons are powerful, powerful teaching tools. Uh, look in the book of James. A lot of exercise on our fingers tonight, huh? Uh, James chapter 3. Verse number three, powerful comparisons here, James 3. Now, the subject is the tongue. It's Hebrews, James. We're talking about the, now that your tongue's not very big, right? I mean, compared to your leg or your head or your shoulder, pretty, pretty small deal here. So, behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths. Now, why do we do that? What does, it, what does the verse say? Why do we put bits in the horse's mouths? That they may obey us. And so what's the purpose of controlling his mouth? Controlling his direction. Okay. That they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. You got a 1,200 pound horse. And you put a bit in him and you can get him to go anywhere you want to go by controlling his mouth. Well, there's another even bigger Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, these things are huge, tons and tons. They're driven to fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. You know, sail, sailboats are not directed by the wind. They're directed by the rudder. And the rudder's the tongue. And so pretty good illustration you want your you want your direction controlled and control your tongue control what you say and then he goes on in verse number five even so the tongue this is just like the horse and the ship all right just like that the tongue is a little member it is and boasteth great things or achievements or exploits behold how great a matter, a little fire. How much fire does it take to burn your house down? Just, just one. Um, the tongue is a fire. It's a world of iniquity. The tongue is small among our members that it defileth the whole body. It's set on fire. The, the course of nature, that means the wheel of life. And what that means is that your tongue and your vocabulary and the words that you choose to say can ruin the whole system of your life. The whole, I'm, I'm talking about your marriage, your work, your friends, everything can be polluted by what you say. All right? Then he talks about um, this thing of poison. And he says, you know, we've, we've tamed all kinds of animals, but we can't tame the tongue. And uh, so just verse 8 says it's, it's like a deadly poison. How much poison does it take to kill somebody? Not much. Well, I didn't say much. You don't have to say much. You, you crush somebody. You hurt their feelings. You embarrass them. You ruin their career or whatever. Um, I, well, I, just, I didn't say a whole lot. You don't have to say a whole lot. You know? I mean, you don't, have to, you don't have to pour a bucket of poison into somebody's tea glass to kill them. Just, you know, just a little bit. Um, look at the book of Isaiah. The, the circle, the wheel of life. 
Isaiah chapter 40. One of my favorite illustrations. Chapter 40, verse number 31. Isaiah 40, 31. Got it? But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew. And the word renew means to exchange. Now what an eagle does is phenomenal. And I'll tell you in just a second. They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as or just like an eagle after they have exchanged their strength. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Eagles do something that is pretty amazing. When they reach a certain age, they'll fly up high into a mountain and they'll get on a spot where nothing can eat them. And they will molt their feathers. All their feathers will come out. Their beak, like your fingernails, the beak will get old. And he'll beat his beak on a rock, knock his beak off. So he can't fly, he doesn't have any feathers. He can't eat, he doesn't have a beak. And he just waits. And after a while, new feathers start growing. And a new beak comes on. And he'll, he'll be a brand new eagle when he comes screaming out of those mountains looking for something to eat. See, he's exchanged his weakness for brand new strength. The illustration is this. We're, we're weak as human beings. But my goodness, get in the presence of the Lord and let him take off all those old things of the old man and, the, you know, our sin nature and we get saved and, oh, he comes screaming out of those mountains ready to tackle the world. And so there's a, there's a comparison of, of us with eagles in the scripture. Now, to me, that's just one of the most powerful. Uh, there he is coming out of those mountains now. All right. Look for lists. I had one student catch these yesterday. Oh, more than two itemized things is a list. And so what we're going to do is look for a list. And so when you're reading a verse and, and you come across these lists, write those things down. They mean something. There are no unemployed words. Is there an order to these things? Look at 1 John chapter 2. Right after 2 Peter, 1 John chapter 2. Verse 16. We just read this a few minutes ago. One of the unintended consequences of this class is we'll learn to find the books of the Bible. <laughs> yeah, you, you won't get good at that. It's 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude and Revelation is right toward the end of the New Testament. All right, look at verse 16. For all that is in the world, all, how much? Everything that the world has to offer can be summarized in a list of three items. Number one, lust of the flesh. Lust just simply means strong desire. Flesh means the physical life. So does the world offer and want you to desire its products and its services and its entertainments and its philosophy? Does it want you to do that? Sure it does. So there's the, the first item in the list. The second item in the list, lust of the eyes. Well, the visual. Oh, my word, the visual. 
The world wants you to just get all caught up and get enamored by, you know, the image. You you got to be beautiful. You got to have this perfect figure. You gotta you gotta be all these kinds of things. And then the pride of life. Pride is not when I think I'm better than you are. Pride is when I am under the false assumption that I'm exempt from the rules. That's what pride is. For instance, um, you have to drive a speed limit, but I don't because I'm a preacher and I'm going to visit somebody. I'm on a godly mission. You're going to work with Michael Kelly. <laughs> Am I exempt from the rules? No, I'm not exempt from the rules. You know, everybody else has to be faithful to their spouse, but not me. Everybody else has to do the right thing, but not. That's pride. That's the very essence of pride. And uh, so there, there's a list right there. Look at Galatians. Galatians 5. Actually, we're going to start in verse number 19. Now, the works of the flesh or the physical life are manifest, and that means clear, obvious. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Anybody use that word today? Lascivious? I didn't either. I didn't either. Um, it means no regard for self-respect. You, you'll do anything. You'll say anything. You know, you'll be caught doing it. It doesn't matter. Um, verse 20, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, um, heresies, uh, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like. There's a list. Now, go down to verse 22. But the fruit, now wait a minute. Go back to verse 19. The works of the flesh. Well, verse 22 says the fruit of the Spirit. See, works, this is just, this is part of what man does as an occupation. But the fruit of the Spirit just grows out of a Christian. This is, uh, I mean, you've got an orange tree, and that orange tree is, is putting on fruit you will never hear it going and then one night an orange pops out you know that doesn't happen it's just the natural fruit right of the rootstock so the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance temperance there is no law against being patient all right, you, all right, Sandy, you've just been a little too kind here, 30 days in jail. There's no law against that. So there's a, there's a list here of, now, what would you rather be? See, these are, by the way, the personality traits of Jesus Christ. That's what this is. This is, this is God reduced to human print. This is a very small list of what God is, but at least this, we, we've got some inkling of the nature of the Lord. And so when I am these things, guess who the world is seeing? They're seeing the Lord. You remember when Paul said, uh, let your light so shine before men? For what purpose, Why? That they may see your good works and they glorify your Father in heaven? The word so there doesn't mean like, oh, there is just so much rain. It's not volume. It's, let's say I had a laser. And I wanted this laser to hit this screen behind me, but I can't just directly do that. I've got to set up a series of mirrors in the auditorium that eventually, bing, bang, bong, 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 bing. So would I have to be precise in the way I set those mirrors? They would have to be just so. That's the way that word is used. I am to precisely angle my life. That the world, not lost people, the, the, that lost people will see and observe and experience my good works and they will glorify. And the word glorify means to form a proper opinion of. 
So when they see me, they form a proper opinion of God. Oh, that's what God's like. Oh, okay. Yes, that is. They are so kind. They're gracious. They're forgiving. They're patient. They're da 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 da. They're seeing God in human form, and that's that's how it's done. Um, Galatians five nineteen through twenty one, and I just read those, so we don't need to do that again. Sometimes I get ahead of myself. So take you, make your list when you're reading along and you come across a, a, a bunch of things. And what I love to do when I'm studying, um, I love words. I just absolutely love words. I want to know what they mean. I've got two dictionaries at the house that are they're dictionaries of word origins. It tells where words came from. And some of the greatest discoveries, oh, my word, what did that word mean? That, that's what that meant originally? Oh, my goodness. Husband, for instance. So we use this word all the time. We don't know where it came from. Originally, it meant house band. And so if you, if you put a steel band around your house to hold it all together, that's what the husband does. You know, he holds stuff together. And uh, so just I, just, I love that kind of stuff because it just, it just, I, I, I like being a midwife to words and help them give birth, you know, so I can see the, the meaning and the flavor and all that kind of stuff. Um, all right, now, <laughs> cause and effect. We're going to read for cause and effect. And often there will be a stated cause and then an effect from that cause. Look at Proverbs, go back to Proverbs 15, verse number 1. I think I have that in my Bible. Okay. What causes a person to redirect their wrath? Give them a soft answer. Exactly. So there's a, there's a cause and effect. What causes a person to go to hell? Well, God sends them to hell. Really? The Bible say that? The Bible doesn't say that. Not at all. So what is the first cause in Proverbs 15.1? Use a soft word, a tender answer. What's the effect of that cause? Their anger, their wrath will be redirected. The second cause, and we've already talked about that, and the second effect. So, our tongue, and we've looked at several uh, verses tonight that, that sort of highlight the tongue. Once you say something, have you ever said something and you were like, uh, 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 oh, no, 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 I shouldn't have said that, I shouldn't have said that. But it's out there. It's like putting something on the Internet. Delete it if you want to, <laughs> but it's out there. And uh, so what's a good thing for me to do then? I need to think. All right, now I'm, I'm uh-huh, I'm aggravated, and I'm ticked off, and if I'm not careful, I'm going to go to the wrong corral, and I'm going to let the wrong horses out. And so what I need to do, Lord, would you just please forgive me of what I'm thinking? Because you already said it to God, you know. And uh, so I need to be very careful about that because uh, words can get people killed physically, maritally, uh, in, in business. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, and I don't want to get into this. I just want to mention it to you. Ron DeSantis was on Fox News yesterday. And he said something that we've said all of our lives. You know, I hope the, the voters of Florida won't monkey with what's going on. They won't, you know. And he's talking, when you say that word, you're talking about fiddle with or mess with. And everybody knew that, but, yeah. Oh, it's a racial term. No, it is not. It's just one word, monkey. What does the word monkey mean? We know what the word monkey meant. And so now that has become an issue in, in this. And it just, the hair stands up on the back of my neck when 
I hear stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love Limbaugh. <laughs> All right. Uh, Romans 6, 23. For the wages, the ration of sin is death. What, what causes a person to die forever? Sin. Now, not acts of sin. You, you don't go to hell for cussing. You don't go to hell for drinking, all right? We're talking about the sin nature. Now, the sin nature produces acts of sin, right? Um, you don't, I read a guy the other day, a preacher that we would know. He said, I wasn't a sinner until I committed an act of sin. Exactly. And I was like, whoa, dude, what are you talking about? Why do you think you committed an act of sin? You know, when is a dog a dog? When he barks? No, he's, when he's conceived, you know, he's a, he's a dog at that point. And so uh, the wages of sin, the ration of sin is death, but on the other hand, contrast that to, you know, the gift of God's eternal life. Uh, so sin is the cause. How do we know that sin was in the world? Look in the book of Romans. Let's turn to Romans. Chapter number 5, verse number 12, uh, 5, I would have, I would have held that up, you'd have been in chapter 2 and a half, <laughs> Romans 5, beginning of verse number 12, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered the world so what was the door that allowed sin into the human species one guy led him into the world and death by sin so what did death bring with it or what did sin bring with it death and so death passed upon all men so it has to be genetic right there's got to be a genetic uh, component to this for all have sinned. How can all have sinned if just one guy sinned? We inherited his nature. Did you know that, this is going to sound a little odd, but uh, did you know that we were not created in the image of God? We were procreated in the image of our Father. Now, huh? our earthly Father. Right. Look in Genesis chapter 5. I mean, we're going to get back. Uh, to Romans but in Genesis 5 because there are just some very cherished fallacies that we have Genesis 5 look at verse 3 Adam lived 130 years and begat a son how and Not the image of God, not the likeness of God. In his now, what was his image and what was his likeness at this point in his personal history? He was a he was a what? He was a moral felon. We call it a sinner. But he was a spiritual criminal. So he had a son, and what kind of image did that son have? Sinful, moral, felonious, spiritual felon nature. That's where we get it from. We get it from from our father and so Adam is the only person the only man created in the image of God and he lost it sin assassinated his spirit now go back to Romans chapter 5 verse number 13 this just gets really interesting in this cause and effect thing but uh, Romans 5 13 for until the law sin was in the world but sin is not imputed where there is no law. All right, now here's the deal. We've got Adam. That was man number one, right? Now, who gave the law? Who was the lawgiver? Moses. All right. How many years between Adam and Moses? 2,000. So we've got 2,000 years between Adam and Moses. So there was no written law for 2,000 years. All right. 
was there still sin in the world? How do we know that? Death. All right. Wherever there's death, you know there's sin. That's the, that's the trademark. Now, but until law, sin is not imputed because sin is not imputed where there is no law. Now, what does that mean? There were no individual sin accounts kept on individuals. Why? There was no law to break. Could you be arrested for wearing pink earrings? Why? There's no law against it. Exactly. Now, what if they passed a law tomorrow that you can't wear pink earrings? Could you be arrested then? Yes. What the law did, it gave man something to break. Now he's held accountable for specificity. Okay? But before, there was no specific, there was no personal individual sin account, even though we were sinners, because where sin, uh, sin is not imputed, there is no law. Nevertheless, all right, forget the fact that there was no law. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. How do we know that? Even over the, the, them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who's a figure of him was, that was to come. And so we look at this cause and effect. People die because of the law of sin and death. Now, not every person that dies, dies because they've committed some heinous act. You understand? Sometimes, well, not sometimes, but people die because of the law of sin and death. That's what takes them. Christians die because of the law of sin and death. We were designed to never, ever, ever, ever die. But we forfeited that. We gave that up. And so now we have been assigned the death sentence. There's a death sentence against us, a death penalty. But Jesus came and he said, I I'm going to die for the death sentence for all of you. I'm just going to collect. I'm going to be the garbage scowl that all of this is dumped on. And I'm going to take it to the cross. And I'm going to die for all you people. And most people in the world are like, no, thank you. I'll die for my own sin, thank you. And that's what they're going to do. Because broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the gate. And there, there are some people in the world, thank God for people like y'all, at some point in your personal history, I don't know when, I don't know where, but at some point you were convinced of that by the person of the Holy Spirit. And when I was a nine-year-old boy, it happened to me. I, my heart was broken, and I got saved. I remember the night I got saved. Ran down the aisle, grabbed my dad's hand, and said, I need to be saved, and he led me to the Lord. Um, so we, we've got this. I, now my sin account and your sin account, is empty now we can we still commit sin no question about that but you understand that your sin account is clean because Jesus cleaned it he took our the death that we were supposed to die has already been died we're already dead we'll never die now physically we're going to be transitioned from here to the to the spiritual world, and so when we when we read the Bible, uh, Romans twelve two. Uh, let's let's get one more, and then we're getting we got about four minutes here. So I'll talk fast. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I'm begging you, by the means of the mercies of God. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. That's an oxymoron. Have you ever seen a living sacrifice? What are sacrifices normally? At, at least at some point in the process, a sacrifice does what? Sacrifice dies. We're a living sacrifice. And so, yes, we're to die daily. And so in that sense, we're a living sacrifice. Um, and so he's talking about that don't be conformed to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of the Don't get don't get mashed into that shape. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how are we as human beings transformed into the image of Christ so that the world can see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven? How does that happen? 
Well, the battle for the Christian life is in the mind. It's in what we think. It's not what you wear. It's not in what you eat. It's, it's not in the places you go. It is in the mind. Now, Jesus was crucified on Golgotha. And Golgotha is a Greek word for a place of the skull. The hill that he died on looked like a human skull. And we've seen it. You can, it's deteriorating quite a bit, but you can still see the outline of a skull. Now, if our Lord was crucified in the place of the skull, don't you think that we need to be crucified in the place of the skull as well, which is the mind? So that, that I, I, need to, I need to attack these thoughts in my mind that, are, that violate God's purpose for my life. They, boy, they become strongholds in me. And I've got to attack those things. And so as, we, as we're reading Scripture, uh, if my mind is transformed, well, what is the effect of that? I can discern God's will. Have you, have you ever run into somebody, and we've ever done this ourselves, I wish I knew what God's will was. Why don't we know God's will? Well, because he's like the Easter bunny, and he's hiding it in the bushes. Why don't I know God's will? My mind is what? Not transformed. See, an untransformed mind will not understand the will of God. And so this is the ability to, to discern God's will. Um, John 3.16. For God so loved the world. How, how do we know that he loved the world? That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so, you know, this, this cause and effect, he came. You don't have to believe in him. It's completely up to you. God gave us a volition. I can say, no, nope, I'll, I'll pay for my own sin account. And, you know, the, the horrible thing is you never, ever, ever pay your total sin debt. How long is a person in the lake of fire? Forever. I mean, there is no, all right, uh, Jim, we're, we're giving you 15 years in hell. I've got a black pastor in Bartow <laughs> named Daryl Jones. And Daryl Jones, he was a student at open school one day, and he was having some trouble at his church. And we were in the kitchen at break time, and he was like, Brother Harris, I'm telling you, said, they, some people ought to go to hell. If it ain't but for 15 minutes, they ought to go to hell. And well, that just doesn't work like that. Doesn't work like that. Thank you all for being here. Uh, did you learn anything? All right. Wonderful. Great. Uh, keep your book. Take it home. Do some homework. Next week, uh, I want to hear your answers. Okay? So, very good. Thank you all. Man, we got one, two, three, four, five, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Are you in the class? Nine. We got nine. Wow. That's terrific. That yeah, y'all, yeah.